Welcome to CMMS Radio, a podcast and general resource for all things CMMS, computerized maintenance management software, from selection to implementation to help you make better choices and have a successful CMMS journey. We'll bring in experts along the way to help us learn more about CMMS, facilities operations, and much more. If you need help with the CMMS project, send a message at cmmsradio.com using the What's On Your Mind link. Suggest a topic, share your CMMS story, or ask questions. So everybody, welcome to CMMS Radio. This is another episode from the Reliable Plant Conference in Orlando, Florida. Important this event because it's the 25th year anniversary, the silver anniversary, and I'm joined by a very special guest today. It's Sean Eisenhower, and he's with Iriducio. He gave a great talk today. It was in one of the learning sessions. We're gonna unpack some of that, but we're also gonna get some background on Sean, how he got into this game, and I really wanna understand a little bit about what Iriducio does. So Sean, take it away. Well, thank you, and thanks for having us. Yeah, we're, uh, we're enjoying the show so far. It's been, uh, been a, a good session with lots of folks that want to talk about maintenance and reliability, so we've enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, we are a education and training consulting company, uh, but we focus on everything from operations through maintenance, uh, including the storeroom and uh, things like uh, uh, CMMS and EAM. And you also have designed out programs that are kind of in a arguable kind of step process, right? Where you can start here, go through, you include coaches and everything somebody needs so they don't have to worry about getting pushed around, right? That's right, yeah. There, we found there's a pretty good group of folks out there in the world that want to do it themselves, right? They don't necessarily want a lot of consulting help, but they but they still need to know and, or want to search out the, the best practices and things like that. So. We build a curriculum, we call it IBL. It's blended learning, inspired blended learning. And uh, the idea behind it is you do have a project and you are working toward a certification through the University of Tennessee. Uh, you are, uh, you've got a coach that you work with. So when you run into a problem, you've got somebody you can talk to and ask questions and they're not a peer. They're not somebody within your facility. So you can be pretty frank with them, right? You know, and, uh, work through the issues that you're facing. So it's, uh, it's been really cool. It's got a, you know, it's got a great track record. We've been doing it now for well over 10 years. Um, and but you know we're super excited because we just unveiled a new version uh, with operations leadership so not only can you train your maintenance managers and your reliability engineers and your planners and schedulers and your storeroom folks you can now also train your ops folks to support their part of it center lining uh, 5s those sort of things uh, and so you're all working together you know on, on a common path but maybe on different elements based on what part of the organization you're from it sounds to me like if, if an organization does that, they're, they're, instead of this kind of silo, they can still have somewhat of a siloed approach, but it's more integrated because they're moving in the same direction, but doing their parts. That's right. One of the problems that we see in a lot of uh, implementations is people don't choose to do all the pieces that they need that, that work together to make it successful. So you'll see them, they'll work really hard and they'll do a lot of really great things, but they're not getting the return on investment. So what we're able to generate is about a 10x return on investment. Uh, we've seen as high with some of our classes as 20x because they are all working together. So if ops is working on, say for instance, operator care, well, at the same same time, maintenance management or reliability engineering might be working on the CMS and the EAM so that when they find something, there's somewhere to put it right. to make sure that it gets planned and scheduled and executed like we need to from a proactive standpoint. So in that regard, with regards to the training or let's say somebody needed help from your organization, you could come in regardless of the CMMS platform they use and help them kind of unpack that and figure out their way so that they're not stuck and lost because a lot of these customers get these great systems, all the systems out there do something great, right? And they get them and they start doing some work orders and they don't do anything else. Right. You see that a lot, right? Underutilization of the CMMS is huge, right? I mean, it comes with an incredible amount of functionality, but but it's like Excel. We only use it for a couple reports that we do, right? So, <laughs> uh, so it's a real, you know, it is a real struggle, but what we're, we're trying to help folks either really one of two ways either we'll we'll help them through education and training and coaching or we can come in and do it for them you know if they need to build a hierarchy or build a criticality or something like that that's great that's great and then 
you know, today, earlier, I sat in on part of one of your learning sessions because I just wanted to get a sense of, you know, I already knew a little bit about you. I had William Sloan on uh, about a month and a half ago, something like that. And I was in there listening to you. And this was a, a talk that was called Applying Mountain Man Wisdom to uh, Achieving Reliability. And one of the things you were talking about, two things. One was culture which comes up a lot on my episodes because I work with a lot of CMRPs coming on the show talking about the realities of maintenance and that you got to connect frontline workforce with the why and all this good stuff. So can you tell me a little bit about culture when it comes to teams, the way they operate with or without a CMMS, and then talk a little bit about ADCAR. Sure, absolutely. So with, from a cultural standpoint, I think, you know, folks don't spend enough time on it. I know we spend plenty of time talking about it, but it's that actual execution that I think we struggle with. And so one of the things I talked about in the presentation this morning was, you know, if you've got a past initiative, whether that be a lean initiative or a lean implementation or a Six Sigma implementation or TQM or any of the acronyms, right? <clears throat> if you were to go and look at it, if you don't think it was successful, why was it not successful? Let's, let's get to the root causes, right? Because you're going to face those same issues again, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, a lot of times people think of culture as this thing that we sprinkle a little something on and that's all we have to do. And really and truly at the end of the day, I've got to understand what's affecting my culture. And I mentioned it in the presentation today. I've been in two facilities in the same industry recently. And in looking at those two facilities, culturally, they're very different. And what I would do in one to help them move forward, I may not do in the other because it's just they're not at the same place. Uh, they don't have the same perspective. And so that's actually where ADCAR might come into play. Um, we talk a lot about ADCAR. It's something that Jeffrey Hyatt developed, a company called ProSci, and it's a nice simple checklist of kind of, you know, what I have to do to get my first followers, to get people on board, to build my team, right, that's going to carry this thing forward. Because if I'm going to change the culture, i got to start with a small group, right? And uh, so the, the, the acronym stands for Awareness, Desire, Knowledge, Ability, and Reinforcement. And uh, there's a lot of information out there. It's very Googleable from that standpoint. But when I look at it, you know, I've got to make people aware of why we need this CMMS, or I've got to make them aware of why we need reliability, or why we need RCA or RCM or whatever. Um, but then I've got to show them what's in it for them and, you know, how to create that desire, which is the second step. When you look at the desire piece, uh, as I said in the session today, one of the struggles is sometimes, unfortunately, um, it's not a positive, right? It's, you know, I, I, I said, you know, you got the carrot and you got the stick. Sometimes you're going to be able to show them what's in it for them. But other times you're just going to have to tell them, hey, this is the new way we're doing things. This is a new culture. And it's going to be more of a, if you like working here, we're going to have to do it this way. Um, but you're still creating desire because you're setting an expectation that they have to do it this way in order to be successful in the new way of doing maintenance. Uh, from there, once we have desire, then we can focus on knowledge. If you're training without first doing awareness and desire, my, my belief is you're kind of wasting your time, right? It's just not, a, you're not going to get a very good return on investment. Um, once you uh, pass on the knowledge, though, knowledge really doesn't have a lot of value until you do something with it. So that ability, that ability to actually change what you're doing. So it could be, in your, in your case, it could be to use the CMMS, to actually move through the screens and populate the fields, right? Until you can do that, there is no value to, to what we're doing. Um, and then last but not least, you know, is reinforcement. You can, you can make people aware and you can make them excited about it and you can train them on the CMMS and make them as happy as possible about that. But once they start using it, entropy will kick in and it will start to try to take them back to where they were before. And so that reinforcement becomes big. It's interesting when you were saying that during the session and you're saying it right now, I keep thinking back to like my days and you, you had a lot of time doing CMMS implementations, all these different uh, groups you were working with and that particular piece where you see the progress and then you see, it almost reminds me of like a PF curve mm -hmm. and they start to kind of degrade in their willingness to use something they already adopted and it's because it's not being reinforced and there's probably some basic strategies that can be incorporated, like maybe around accountability, maybe 
showing them, hey, you guys just did all this and look what it did. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of the approach? Absolutely. I'll, I'll tell you one of the things that I've been kind of yelling from the mountaintops anytime anybody will listen here lately is, is this idea of actually mapping the business processes or how you use the CMMS. Now, we, we talk about more than that, right? So not just the actual interaction with the CMMS, but how you do business in that organization. But then going through and understanding the RACI or the RACI, who's responsible, who's accountable, what support and what information. If you take the time to do that, if I know, and, and we talk about when we talk about responsibility, we talk about the person who's going to do the step, the job, the process step. Uh, accountability is who's going to make sure that they do it. They're boss in a lot of cases. Um, for the support or consultant, depending on which model you're using, it's who you're going to get engaged and have discussion with. And then the I, the I is typically inform or information, you know, who just needs to know that we did something, right? If you take the time to go through and map your business processes and do your races, then you can go through and actually talk about, look, you've got these 17 R's in your role. You have to do these 17 R's. If you only do 14 of them, you're going to break the process. Right. And as a boss, what I think it gives me more than anything, if I have the a the accountability, right, I now know what you're supposed to do in your role. And I may have never held your role. You know, you might be a reliability engineer and I've only ever been a maintenance manager. Right. But if I know what your R's are and I know where I'm accountable to make sure you're doing your R's, then I can actually talk to you in your performance review. I can make sure that I'm hiring the right kind of people to fill the roles. It's just a game changer. The next piece is, uh, you know, if I know your R's, I can build training specifically to your R's. You know, I've, I, while I'm hearing you say this, I'm thinking about this idea that, you know, we're, we're, we report up, we've got subordinates, if you will. I don't mean that in a negative way, but we have direct reports mm -hmm. and we've got a lot of people lateral and we want a lot more lateral movement to see it as like this thing that's all moving in the same direction. And when you, when you do this particular aspect you were describing, I think it's important when you, when you understand the R's, if I'm grasping mm -hmm. this properly, that you understand them, but you don't pretend to be knowledgeable of, of how that person does it, but more so respectful and giving them their autonomy, but still keeping them accountable. And that's how you keep yourself accountable. And that sounds to me or feels to me like a better culture where people feel like they can do what they got to do to get the job done because they've got that support from above and beside them. You know, think of soldiers, right? Mm -hmm. Left and right, you cover those guys that's and right. so on and so on. And it's, it's really getting back to that idea of the human element, the actual culture, you're instituting behavioral change. And if people are so willing to go on this journey and buy into it, actually do it, they're going to reap incredible benefit in their top line revenue, their bottom line is going to improve as it relates to improved efficiencies and what we can gain there. And you've done all this in not just plant environments, but facility centric environments, uh, probably large, say, land, land systems mm -hmm. where you have, you know, oil rigs, all these different things. You've seen all of that, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you since we're here at the Reliable Plant Conference is, and you, you've participated in this many times, right? Oh yeah. It's like, not my first year. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And you, you do a lot of, a lot of other events like this, but what is it about the Reliable Plant Conference and you know how Noria sets it up and everything that you enjoy the most, that you look forward to the most? I think it's probably the audience. It's a, it's a really good audience and, you know, they seem engaged and, uh, you know, the session was full. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's awesome because, I mean, you want to, you want to, you know, kind of have a discussion with these folks. And I think one of the other things that this, this hopefully will do over the next two days is allow everybody to come by the booth and, and talk for a little bit and, and get their problems addressed. Right. Because, um, you know, it, it is, it's, you know, there's a lot of different problems people are facing, but interestingly enough, across the industries, many of them are the same. Yeah. And that now speaking of industry, um, just a couple of other things, cause I know you got a lot of stuff to do and I took a picture of the booth. So since we're doing no filming on these episodes for at reliable plant, uh, I'm going to include that so that people can kind of see and get a feel for it. But currently there's a lot of talk about 
people leaving industry because they're retiring, they're moving on, we're going to potentially lose this knowledge. We sometimes call it tribal knowledge. And then, you know, the younger generations are coming up, but they work a little bit differently. Do you see that as a major concern at the different places where you're consulting that they're having a labor shortage because those skilled trades are not pushed like they once were in the 80s and 90s? I think it's a huge problem right now, and it really doesn't matter who, what industry you're talking about. Uh, we, I was in D.C. last week, heard very loud and clear from that facilities organization that they can't find people. Uh, I was in uh, a food and beverage company just recently, and I was in an uh, automotive company, and they're all facing the same thing. It, it just, it seems like it's a huge problem, you know, where we had, you know, in the past technicians that have been with us for 15 or 20 years, now we're lucky to get two or three. And so it's, it's a struggle. It absolutely is. Yeah, and I, I think about it too, and there, there's many different ways to solve it, and I don't think there's a, a, a pure answer yet. We're, we're discovering that. There's a big paradigm shift in the way data is captured, whether it's being used properly. There's AI now. That's going to be already a game changer and all these kinds of things. I want to bring it back to CMMS, though. So when we're talking about all these things like culture and behavioral changes and setting up that right plan ahead of time before you even initiate this project, right? You were talking about that in the session as well. But with the CMMS, I think everybody needs to always remember it's a tool mm -hmm. and that's fine. It's good. It's going to do a lot of great things for you, but it's the people that are using it and pushing it that are actually going to make that initiative successful. That's right. If you don't plug the tool into a process, it's just a tool, right? You can give me uh, you can give me a lot of special tools, but if I don't know how to use them, it doesn't have a lot of a, a lot of re, uh, a lot of an ROI, right? At the end of the day, but you know what we're <clears throat> what we're seeing specifically in this area that um, I think is going to be important over the next few years, specifically related to CMMS, is the use of a job plan library. Building your job plan library either into your CMMS or dynamically linking to it uh, because the skill level is dropping. Uh, we don't have that same level of skill. So now if you want precision maintenance, if you want uh, belt alignments and torque specs and, and, the, and those sort of things, you're going to have to write that into the job plan library. So we're finding that we're spending a lot of time working with clients today to build really good job plans that will reside in their CMMS and be reused over and over for not just PM work, not just preventive maintenance work, but for the corrective maintenance work out of those PMs as well. Indeed. I, I couldn't agree with that more. I think that's a really good call out. And I think the other thing we have to keep in mind with that is maybe that once that happens, companies that utilize these various platforms need to make a practice of not, you know, don't hit it and forget it. Right. Do regular kind of assessments because that's a form of the reinforcement you were talking right. about with, with ADCAR. And then the other thing is... Um, don't neglect the feedback you get from the frontline that's workforce right. that's going to give you the most critical data. Yep. Because the stuff that really happens, I like to say the shit that really gets done is the shit that matters. Mm -hmm. We just need to collect it, gather it, and interpret it properly so we can get our organization as a whole moving. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, it's, I, I think this is going to be a big area, and I think you have to look at it end to end process, right? So if you're talking about the CMMS, that's a section of the process, but we were talking about it in the session today, if, if you don't make sure the full process is there, you end up kind of running the football all the way down the field and then dropping it on the five yard line. And we're having a lot of customers come to us right now and they're like, we're working hard. We've implemented a CMMS and we've implemented failure codes and we've implemented PMs and all these sort of things. But then you start to look at them and no one's reviewing the failure codes. You start to look at the PMs and you realize they're not written with any level of specificity or detail or quantifiable. And then you look at the corrective maintenance work and you find out that, yeah, they're writing corrective maintenance job plans, but the supervisors aren't making sure that the, the techs and the craftsmen use them in the field. So in every one of those situations, we've done a lot of hard work and we feel like, man, we're really pushing this hard, but we're not getting a return on investment because we didn't carry the ball down the field. That's right. And we think it didn't work when in yeah. fact we didn't work. That's right. The process we is until, broken. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's this, this is great. And I think we're probably going to have to continue the conversation on subsequent episodes. I hope we can do that. Absolutely. And since we're here at the reliable 
Bible Plant Conference. I want to make sure you can get back to Booth. I know there's a lot of people that want to talk to you. Um, just for everyone that's listening to this, uh, if you want to reach out to Iriducio, go to iriducio.com. R-U-D-I-T-I-O. Oh, there you go. He's helping me out here. E-R-U-D-I-T-I-O, because I wasn't looking at my notes, dot com. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we'd love to chat with folks. They're welcome to reach out on my cell phone as well and text me or call me, 843-810-4446. Again, you know, we love to customize things specifically to the problems that people are facing. So if there's something out there that somebody wants to try to figure out how to do it with education or to, to do, get it done for them from a consulting standpoint, let us know. That's awesome. Sean, I really appreciate the time, man. It, it's, it's brilliant to meet you. And Good to meet you. appreciate you doing yeah, this absolutely. episode with us. And uh, just one more time, everybody, that's E-R-U-D-I-T-I-O dot com. Iriducio, check them out. They are there to help you. That's no joke. Thanks for being on CMMS Radio. Thanks for having me. You got it. Did you find this episode helpful? please send us some feedback, suggest a topic, or ask a question. Reach out to CMMS Radio if you need a co-pilot on your CMMS project. Visit cmmsradio.com and use the What's On Your Mind link. Thank you for tuning in to CMMS Radio, your resource for all things CMMS from selection to implementation to help you make better choices, learn from industry experts, and have a successful CMMS journey.